Women, go to Genesis 3.15, please. Is the theme of the Bible. And in Genesis 3.15 we read, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, talking about the serpent, and thou shall bruise his heel, the serpent of what, what happened to Christ. So the theme of the Bible is Genesis 3.15 all the way through. It's not really the history of mankind, as people want to put it. It is the history, though, of two men. By man, the first Adam, came sin, and sin by death. By man, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, came the resurrection of the dead. 1 Corinthians 3, 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Who shall be made alive? When the all is those in Christ. That's the key. Even so in Christ shall all. The all is not everybody in the world. It's all those that are in Christ. And we have that simply by the faith that we put in the completed work of Christ at Calvary and our faith in his faithfulness to accomplish what he had to do. So we're going to get to Gethsemane, and there's four things of why, but before we do that, I made a critical error when I put something on the board last week, and I put that the church, and then I put, began at Pentecost. I meant to say not at Pentecost. It began with the dispensation of the grace of God, which was not revealed to was revealed to the Apostle Paul. So the three grave errors that people make, so therefore you have to do the unlearning that you learn in all your tradition that I learned in the denomination, as you probably did also, to actually understand the truth of the Word of God. The first grave mistake that people make that we taught last week was that the New Testament begins with Genesis 1. There's nothing in Genesis about the te Old Testament. The Old Testament begins with Moses at Sinai when he gave the law to the nation Israel. So for 2,500 years from Adam to Moses, there was no Old Testament. There was no law. Okay, A Abraham did not even live under the law. There was a covenant made to him of circumcision, but not the law that was given, the Old Testament that was given to Moses. The second grave mistake people make is they start the The New Testament cannot begin, and we have a verse in Hebrews, please go there, to prove that, that the Old Testament cannot uh, until the testator dies, and that wasn't until the end of that. So if somebody would read Hebrews 9, verses 15 and 16, please. That makes it very clear where the New Testament begins. It cannot begin until the testator dies. Christ did not die until the end of Matthew. He lived under the Old Testament, under the law. He was killed by the Old Testament. Remember when they said, by our law, he should be killed. The blasphemy that he said he was God. That they said why he should die. So he taught under the law. He lived under the law of the Old Testament. If somebody will read verses 15 and 16 of Hebrews, it'll be very clear. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where, there is a te for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. So, so very clearly here, the first grave mistake is that we start the Old Testament, Genesis 1. It could not have started to Sinai. There's 2,500 years from Adam until Moses. It began with Moses in Exodus 20. The second grave mistake that mankind makes in all denominations, they start the New Testament with Matthew 1. And it, you can't have a New Testament until the testator died. We just proved that. The third grave mistake is that they say the church, the body of Christ, the dispensation of the grace of God, began at Pentecost. It did not begin until the Apostle Paul 
received the dispensation of the grace of God, which was hidden in God since before the foundation of the world. Why was it a mystery? Because it was hidden God, but it's not hidden God anymore. It's now revealed to Paul from Christ, from the heavens, the dispensation of the grace of God that Paul says, I am the apostle to Gentiles, I magnify my office. You cannot have a church of body of Christ until the casting away of Israel. Go to Romans 11, please, real quickly. And in Romans 11, if you'll listen very carefully as we read here, as Paul makes a very clear statement here in 11n, starting in verse 12 of then, because you cannot have the church, uh, the dispensation grace of God until Israel is cast away, till Israel has fallen, until Israel has been diminished. And that Peter never told us that at Pentecost. Christ never told us that in the book of Acts. But let's read carefully. Now, if the fall of them, verse 12, be the riches of the world, talking about Israel, and the diminish of them be the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my office. He's not one of the twelve. He's not the thirteenth. Paul says, I magnify my office, not himself. I magnify my office there. But now let's continue. If by any means I may provoke emulation to them that are of my flesh. He's talking about his brethren in the flesh, which is Israel there. And might save some of them. But here's the key. This is what we know. For if the casting away of them, of Israel, be the reconciling of the world, what shall the reconciling of them be but life from the dead? So you cannot have the dispensation of the, uh, the grace of God until Israel is cast away. That did not happen at, you know, when Christ was here on earth, and that did not happen at Pentecost. We're going to see very clearly that, it, that Peter preached to the men of Israel, to the men of Judah, to the house of Israel, and to the children of the prophets. He said this message is given. So, very clearly, you cannot have the dispensation of God until the middle wall partition is broken down. And Paul is the first one that tells us that. Go to Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 14 through 16. People do not want to study the Word of God. They want to read Scripture. They want to take passages and take it all to them and make it so personal and talk about a relationship they have with Christ and that, but that is not even mentioned, it never talks about you and I having a relationship with Jesus Christ. We have to be identified with Jesus Christ, with His death, with His burial, with His resurrection. Therefore I died with Christ, I was buried with Christ, and I've been resurrected with Christ and have a new life in Christ by putting my faith in the completed work of Christ at Calvary, His shed blood. That, he, that paid for all of my sins. So look at Ephesians chapter 2, 14 through uh, 16. For he is our peace, in verse 14, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of perfection between us, and have abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. He nailed the law to the cross for you and I but to make in himself of the twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body, talking about Jews and Gentiles, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. You do not hear that message until you get to Paul. You take Paul's epistles out of the Word of God, and you will know nothing. You, and you will believe, if you go to John, that the middle wall of partition is still existing. Because John said in John 4 that salvation is of the Jews. So therefore there's a distinction there. And he says now it's been broken down. So then what does he say to us in Ephesians chapter 3? As we continue on, notice what he says. Verse 2, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, not to the twelve, given to me. How that by revelation, if you have a revelation, there has to be something taught now that was not known before, it's not a revelation. 
So if Peter taught it, then it's not a revelation that could be given to Paul. But he said, how about revelation? How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words. Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, Ephesians 4. And then in Ephesians 9, he says, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. And in verse 8, he says, I preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. I preach the unsearchable, meaning you can't find it anywhere else until you come to the Apostle Paul and the revelation was given to him. So only in Paul's epistles can you find the church, the body of Christ. It's amazing that people try to put it everywhere when you can't even find that term, the body of Christ, anywhere else but in Paul's epistles. Christ never used the term on earth. Peter never uses the term, the body of Christ. Because... Peter preached about a New Testament church that is, was going to, is going to be established on the earth, which he offered them at Pentecost, but they rejected that kingdom. So that New Testament church cannot be established until Christ sits on the throne of his father David. So let's look at it very clearly now. So we know that that revelation of the mystery... What was hidden God was first revealed to the Apostle Paul. So what did Peter preach then? So if you try to start the body of Christ in Acts 2, first of all, you don't have the middle wall partition broken down. But there's a key element in Acts chapter 2 that Peter makes very clear to you and I. What is being taught? So in Acts chapter 2, Peter says something very significant. First of all, who is he speaking to? He doesn't say he's speaking to Jews and Gentiles. Because if you look in, in verse 25 of Acts 2, he says, ye are the what? Oh no, I'm sorry, I'm in Acts 3, forgive me. Go to Acts 2 first. Go to 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, ye men of Judah... And all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be it be known unto you, and hearken to my word. He's speaking to a specific group of people. To a nation that has crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. And has rejected him. So, go to verse 22. And it says, what ye men of Israel, hear these words. So we know very clearly who he's speaking to. If you go down to Acts 2.30, to, uh, to Acts he's going to tell you exactly what Jesus Christ is going to come back to do. And notice very clearly what he says. He doesn't preach a heavenly message that we're going to heaven. Notice verse 30. Therefore being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, talking about David, according to the flesh, he would raise up to Christ to sit on his throne. Whose throne? David. His father David. His earthly father, not his father in heaven. His earthly father. A promise that was given to David. And notice now what he says should happen now in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of, uh, the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, what? Both Lord and Christ. These people tell us that there's one gospel, I hear this all the time, are not actually studying the Word of God. Tracy's doing a wonderful study on all the gospels um, on Wednesday night. The gospel of God, when I look at clarity, is about the identity of Jesus Christ, who He is. And that's what Peter says. He is Lord and He is Christ. The gospel of God is about the identity of Christ, that he is deity and that he is the Messiah. And in Acts 10, when he goes to Cornelius, he said he is the judge of the living and the dead. That's the th when I look at it, that's the three aspects of the gospel of God. He is Lord, he is deity, he is the Son of God, he is the Messiah, he is the Christ, and that he is the judge of the living and the dead. That's the three aspects, when I look at it, what the gospel of God is. The gospel of Christ is what Paul preached, which is the comp
consequence of what Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary. His shed blood that takes us away all sin. Peter doesn't say that at Pentecost. Later on when you get to, the, to Peter's gospel, he'll talk about that. Where would he have learned that? He learned that from the Apostle Paul. That's very clear if you know what took place at the Council of Jerusalem. Paul says, they had nothing to tell me. How is that possible for men that have spent three years here for Christ? And Paul would say, they had nothing to, uh, to add to me in Galatians. But he said, I, on the contrary, I had much to add to them. Because the gospel of uncircumcision was given to me, as the gospel of circumcision was given unto Peter. Paul in, in Romans 15, 8 says very clear, Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision to fulfill the promises made unto the fathers. We have to read scripture and believe it. He says in Corinthians that we do not know Christ anymore after the flesh. Even though we have known our flesh, we don't know him after the flesh anymore. So very clearly, in Acts 2, and now what is his message in Acts 2.38, if somebody will read that. What is the gospel message in Acts 2.38? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If there is one gospel and one message, you have to find a verse in Paul's epistles that Paul ever says that. And you cannot. There's not one time Paul ever says that. Because Paul says, I was not called to baptize. How could that be then if he's preaching this gospel? Because the gospel that Peter preached, baptism was essential. Remember in Luke 7, 20, it says that the leaders of Israel rejected the counsel of God by not being baptized. Water baptized. We have a baptism day, but it's a death baptism. We're baptized and identified into the death of Jesus Christ. But very clearly here, this message was not ta taught by Paul. This was Peter's message to a nation who had rejected Christ. What did they need to repent of? What he just told them in Acts 2.36, you have crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you have to change your mind about your thinking that he is deity, that he is the Messiah, and that he is the judge of the living and the dead. And therefore you need to be baptized in the name of the for the mission and you receive the gift of the... And the gift of the Holy Spirit was power that the twelve had, that everyone was healed. Everyone lived in one accord at Acts, which is not true, of course, today. So very clearly... We know what Peter is. So what was his message in, in Acts 3, Peter's message? Peter's message was not, if you put faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, your citizenship will be in heaven, as Paul says in Philippians 3.20. Notice what he says will happen if the nation Israel repents, changes their thinking about this Messiah, is baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for remission of sins. And that's also an interesting statement. Our fundamental brothers say that we're under the, uh, the commission of the great commission of Matthew 28 to be baptized in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, if that started Pentecost, why did Peter tell them only to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? If we're under that great commission. You can't find anywhere in the book of Acts that anybody was ever baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit until you get to the false church that started maybe, I don't know how long, after Paul. Because why they had to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the Messiah they had rejected. The, gospel, the, the baptism of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were to the nations, and Israel was not included in the nations. They are separated from the nation. That is the commission that will be fulfilled when Christ sits on his throne here with the twelve, when they, the Jews take that message out to the Gentile world. And they will baptize the Gentiles in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Godhead that they do not know. The Word of God is so clear if you disbelieve the passage, but now let's look at Acts chapter 3. Verse 19, repent again, he says. Be ye therefore be converted, for your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Where is he going to send him? Back to this earth, 
to sit on David's throne of his earthly father David to rule and then you'll have universal peace on the earth and the 12 apostles will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel that we know from Matthew 18. That is what the 12 are called to do, to sit on 12 thrones to rule to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Paul says, I am the apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my office. And notice there, so it's a time of refreshing, of course it'll be a time of refreshing. It'll be a time of restitution of all things when Christ sits on that throne. And Israel will have the kingdom that they were promised. And notice how clearly who he's writing to in verse 25 of Acts 3. He says, ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers. That can't be any clearer, but yet we try to take that covenant and give it to us. Saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed, the physical seed of Abraham, shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. That's Genesis 12. He told Abraham, I will bless them that bless you and curse them that cursed you. A Gentile got, bla uh, got blessed by blessing the nation of Israel. Today we're blessed through the casting away of Israel, the diminishing of Israel, the falling away of Israel. It is so beautiful to take God's word and rightly divide it, and then you, if not, you'll be totally confused and have no idea what God's doing today. And notice what Peter says, which is so clear in verse 21. Who the heavens, heavens must receive until the times of the restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets, how or since what? Since the world began. Paul says, my message was hid in God since before the foundation of the world. We have been chosen in God in Ephesians 1 through before the foundation of the world. Peter says, everything I'm telling you is from the foundation of the world. Peter says, I'm preaching this searchable riches of Christ. In that same passage, notice what he says. For verse 22, for Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord our God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto you him, you shall hear all things, whoever you shall be unto you. And if you notice back in 24, yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that followed after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Peter says, everything I'm telling you has been spoken from the prophets from Moses to Malachi to John the Baptist. Nothing new. It's just to fulfill in that. Paul says, I preach the unsearchable riches of Christ, which was hid in God since before the foundation of the world. If you can rightly divide scripture, you're going to be approved of God rather than being ashamed. Timothy 2, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved of God, no workman who needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. You can either be approved or today, and you have to see it. Now, how about when Christ was here on earth? I hope I get to Gethsemane this morning. But there are two women that absolutely make clear this message. And how do we know that? Once you go to Matthew 15, and I want you to go to Luke 13. There's two women that shows that the middle wall partition has not been broken down. Jew and Gentile are not the same. That there is a difference. And in Matthew 15, he's going to come to a Syrophoenician woman who wants to be healed. She has a daughter that she wants to be healed and she comes to Christ. <laughs> Now notice this loving Christ that we talk about in the Gospel, and notice clearly verse 22 of uh, chapter 15. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast, and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy unto me, a Gentile. She's a Gentile woman. Thou son of David, my daughter, is grievously ill with the devil. And he answered her, a word or not a word? Not a word. Not a word. He didn't even want to speak to her. Because he had already said that back in, in Matthew 4, I come only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He sent the twelve only out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And let's continue now. And he answered, okay, and go to verse, uh, and he, answer, he said, he answered and said unto her, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him and saying, Lord, help me. She asked again, a second time. 
But he answered and said, It is not meet, verse 26, to take the children's bread, talking about Israel, and to cast it to dogs. What does he call her there? It has to be what he calls her. He, Israel, the children, Gentiles are dogs here. Let's continue. And he sa she said, Truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. And people get confused because they say, See? But what was her faith? Well, you don't get that until you actually read the second account. What was her faith? So hold on to that and go to Mark 7. That's why you have to read all the passages in Mark chapter 7. Notice what her faith was. Starting in verse 27 of Mark 7. But Jesus said unto her, let the children first be filled. This is the same account. For it is not meet to take the children's bread, Israel, and to cast it unto dogs, Gentiles. And she answered and said to them, Yea, Lord. Same thing as she said, Truth, Lord. Yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumb. Now she said the same thing. But remember he said it's because of her faith. But what was her faith? That's why you have to read both accounts. And he said unto there, her, what? For this saying, that's the key there, for this saying, go thy way, the devil has come out of your daughter. What saying? That she said, truth, Lord, I know who I am, but even the dogs take the crumbs of the table to come off the table of the children's bread. So you have to understand what her faith was. If you didn't have Mark's account, as people say, well, see, it was her faith. But her faith in what? In her saying, she realized her position. Now go to Luke 13, and notice the difference when there's a daughter of Abraham. And what is amazing about this account of the daughter of Abraham is that you'll notice something so very significant, she doesn't even ask for a healing. I love it. She doesn't come to her and say, and heal me. Let's look at that. It's starting in verse 10. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together so bad and could in no wise lift her up herself. That's how bad her condition was. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him. He wouldn't even speak to the Syrophoenician woman. He calls this good lady to him and said to a woman, Thou art loosed from thy infirmity. We're not going to read the whole account, but go down to verse 16. And ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound these 18 years, be loosed from the bond on the Sabbath day? When the king is here, according to Isaiah 33, all infirmities will be healed. And the king was there. And he's given him examples of what the kingdom will be like. So you can see in those examples that the middle wall partition has not been broken down until you get to the Apostle Paul. One didn't even ask for a healing, but she got it because she was not the other one Christ would not even speak to until she put herself in the position of knowing who she was. Now, one last account. Go to Luke 2. And why I'm going here real quickly is what is it all about? Because there's going to be a season coming up called the Christmas season. And they're going to preach Luke 2 over and over again. Remember what Christ said? Even though we have known Christ after the flesh, we know him no more. They're going to emphasize the birth of Jesus Christ. And notice what the message will be. And notice what they'll be talking about when they talk about peace. Chapter 2 and verse 11 of Luke. This will be the Christmas message that will be preached in every church other than ours. Even by our friend and best brother. Unto you is born this day, verse 11, chapter 2, in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord.
And this shall be a sign unto you. Who are signs to? To the nation Israel. Ye shall buy, find the, ba the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Verse 14 is going to be spoken over and over and again. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. When will that happen? All you have to do is go back to Luke chapter 1. When will that happen? When there will be universal peace? When Christ sits on his throne. Go to verse 31 through 33, and if somebody will read Acts 1, 31 through 33, rather than me reading. You mean actually. Luke 1, I'm sorry, verse 31 to 33. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Is that very clear? He will sit on the throne of his father David. Where? On this earth. So when they talk about the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Christ said, they think that kingdom is in the heaven. He didn't say it's in the heaven. He said it's, it'll come from the heavens. That's the new Jerusalem that uh, Revelation talks about coming down from heaven under the earth. But this will all take place. So that Christmas story. So what would our peace be? That talks about universal peace to the world when Christ sits on his throne. And there will be peace because he'll destroy the Antichrist and he'll destroy the pagan armies and he'll set up this wonderful kingdom to nation Israel. What, would, what message should we be preaching at, at uh, Christmas time? Go to Colossians 1.20. This is what our Christmas message should be. Colossians 1.20. Where do we get our peace? That's not what it says here in Luke chapter 2. Somebody read verse 20, please, of Colossians 1. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. What a wonderful peace. We have it already. But it's through the what? The blood of the cross. You won't hear that preached. At a Christmas message. They'll be preaching at Luke 2. The angels coming and all this to the shepherds and so forth. That's a promise. And how do I know, in closing, how you cannot change a covenant as people want to do today and say, yes, we are now Israel and so forth, and then those blessings are to us. All you have to do is go to Psalms 89. People don't realize that Psalms is a book of prophecy. Psalms 89 will make this very clear. Psalms 89 will make this very clear in 34 through 37. The covenant was made with Israel, and notice what it says in Psalms uh, 89. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is going out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. So very clearly it said that covenant can't be altered. And how do we know what is made? Go back to verse 3 of chapter 89. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. You cannot alter a covenant that was made to Israel. You cannot change it and now make it to you and I. The New Testament church has not been established yet. Church only means called out. Israel is called the church in the wilderness in Acts 7. We are the church, the body of Christ, not known until we come to the Apostle Paul. Whew! <laughs> now, go real quickly if we have time. And I said I wanted to close with Gethsemane and why it's important to understand these, this, these, this uh, passage. There's four accounts. I hope I can get it real quickly, so I hope that he'll bear me. So I want you to go to Matthew 26. There's four accounts of his agony in Gethsemane. Matthew 26, 